as we look at the book of Jeremiah and, and study your word, uh, we ask that we would learn, we would learn much from this prophet and what was going on around him in his day. Uh, God, we don't want our hearts to be hardened uh, to your word or to you, to the things of yours. And so, God, um, let us learn from other people's mistakes and, um, and take these things, Lord, and, uh, and watch our own hearts. And so we ask you to bless the time that we have together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Jeremiah, you know the book of Jeremiah is... To me, it's like it's sort of a sad book because it ends with the complete destruction of the nation of Judah. I mean, Israel's already destroyed, and northern kingdom's already destroyed, southern kingdom's going to be destroyed. And I mean, by the end of Jeremiah, Jerusalem is just leveled. I, I mean, Babylonians not only conquered it, they made it an example to all other nations of the world of what happens when you rebel against Babylon. And so, I mean, that's Jeremiah. Everything's moving in that direction. And one of the things, though, that we've been seeing as we've been going through through the book of Jeremiah is that things didn't have to end up that way. Didn't have to. I mean, that was a trajectory of their paths. There's no doubt about it. It was the road that they, they were on because they, they weren't following the ways of God, and God was warning them about it. But all the prophecy was given to them for the reason, well, not so that they would take a fatalistic view of it and go, well, you know, this is just the way that it is, and I guess that's what's just going to happen. It's, it wasn't for that reason. I think a lot of people take this fatalistic view of, of life, and when it comes to the things of God, they go, well, you know, God's going to do what God's going to do. It's like you, like you don't even believe it. You're like a, an, an atheist when you say stuff like that. But the prophecy was given to exhort Judah, to exhort the people, to rebuke them, to correct them, to call this nation to repentance, that there would be a healing of the land, that there would be renewal going on in, in the people. But, but the problem was Judah um, had, well, what the condition of the human heart can so often be, is this apathetic heart towards God. In other words, I mean, here's this nation, they're hearing the words of the prophecy, and they're, and they're coming across, God's telling them of the warning, and they're just going like, well, you know, they're just in this place of apathy. You know, we really should do something, but, you know, I don't know how it's really going to make any difference at all. Well, you know, I mean, I know it's a little different there, but, you know, I don't see how it's going to amount to anything. Yeah, we should draw near to God, but... Well, it's not like we're really that far away. See, a hardened heart is one that will not allow God's word to penetrate even when it's in need, dire need of renewal. It's kind of like a land when it hasn't rained for some time, you, you know, and when it's just dry out and it's like drought time and there's just been no, sort of like earlier this year, we had it a little bit, a little bit. But when it doesn't rain for a long time, all the soil starts getting packed right in and the dust works its way in through. And then when it does rain, when you have these downpours, what happens? doesn't even penetrate the soil, right? It just washes over the soil. That's what happens with a hard heart, right? It's like these flash floods happen. There's lots of water, but nothing penetrates. And, you know, God's word can go forth, but the capacity for the absorption of God's word, the capacity for the Holy Spirit to work in, that, in a person's life and to make that heart new, well, a person just gets used to a hardened heart. And the only remedy for that, the only remedy for that is to recognize that there's a heart that's been hardened and then beg, beg God to take that hardened heart and to soften it. Anything less than that forcefulness there is, well... It's, it's not going to do it. It's just going to allow, like, the rains come, and there's barely any kind of penetration at all, just the vast amounts of washing away of, um, of the water running downhill. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people. They know, like, I need renewal, but I really don't want to, like, 
I, I really don't want to work in order to get that heart renewed. I'm just going to settle with this heart and heart because I don't really want to beg God for a new one. Well, tonight we're going to meet a king. His name is Zedekiah. He's one of the first of four kings we're going to meet tonight. He would be, Zedekiah is going to be the last king of Judah. It would be under his rule that the last batch of people are going to be taken into captivity, and there's not going to be a whole lot of them being taken at this point in time. And it's during his reign that Jerusalem would be raised. In 2 Chronicles, it says this of him. It says that Zedekiah reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of God. He didn't humble himself. And so there's an implication going on there that he had the opportunity, he had the chance to humble himself, but he just never did. Again, hardened heart. Hardening his heart to the word of God was easier to him than softening his heart. And you know what it is? It's, it's real simple. Because when you have a hardened heart, when it comes to God's word, this is what you do. You say, tomorrow. You know, I know like that's where I'm at right now, but tomorrow I'm going to change things. And it's always tomorrow. Um, and, you know, tomorrow I'm going to get serious about God's word, or soon I'm going to get serious about it. And the problem is time runs out, and Zedekiah is going to find that. So chapter 21, let's begin. The word of the Lord came to Jer Jeremiah from, uh, I'm sorry, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pasher, son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Mahasiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works that the king may go away from us. Zedekiah reigned 11 years. His reign was from 597 to 586 B.C. 588 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came with his armies and surrounded Jerusalem, and they set a siege against the walls of Jerusalem, and they stayed that way for two years, starved them out. By 586, it was just absolutely horrid within the walls of Jerusalem, um, and then they would just go in and they would, they would, they would conquer. Chapter 21 here begins about the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign. So he reigns for 11 years. So he's, it's right at the time when Nebuchadnezzar is coming down with his armies and Jerusalem is in their sights. Okay? That's the deal. Now, Judah has been a vassal nation. It, it was a vassal nation to Babylon. Before that, they were a vassal nation to Egypt. They rebelled under the reign of Zedekiah. Zedekiah had all these prophets around him and you know, false prophets, and all his counselors were saying, Well, you know, you really should just stop paying tribute to the Babylonians. And what you do is you take that money and you go and you give it to Egypt instead and you buy their armies. And so they'll stand up for you. And it seemed really right in people's eyes. It seemed like the smart thing to do. But the problem was, is nobody asked God. So I mean, they're doing all these motions, they're going through all the motions, and like asking God was sort of a secondary kind of thought to them. And so, you know, of course, the people of the day, the prophets of the day, the counselors of the day would say um, to Zedekiah, well, you know, we're God's people. You know, I mean, like, we're going to be, you know, God wants this nation to be great again, and we're not slaves to anybody. And it's all the rhetoric that a dying nation wants to hear. The false prophets gave them, and they gave it to them in abundance. But the fact was is that God's people were lazy. They never interceded on behalf of the nation. They were lazy. Yeah, we'll go buy the Egyptian armies. We'll go, we'll go do other things. But we don't want to do the work of waiting upon God. Because you know waiting upon God's work. It is work. To sit still before God, to wait on him, to intercede on behalf of the nation or intercede on behalf of the leaders of the nation, that's work. And so they just figured, well, let's just go buy the Egyptians a lot easier. You, you know, and so they got rulers 
Judah got rulers and they got prophets that fit their condition, their spiritual state that they were in. And I look at today's political scene in, in America, and if there is ever a time, I don't know about you, if there is ever a time for God's children to wake up, I think it just might be now. I, I mean, can't we see, I, I mean, look what's being presented before us as choices for leaders of our nation. Are you telling me out of 325 million people, these two are the cream of the crop? I, you know, I mean, I don't want, I'm not going to get all political on it, but I, but I mean, like, that's the cream of the crop for leadership? Or is God just giving us what we deserve so that the church might go, well, hold on, maybe we should start praying. Maybe we should start interceding. But anyway, anyway, um, one in, verse, verse two, you know, so these guys are coming and Nebuchadnezzar's en route, these, these leaders of the people, and, and they say, you know, perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works. We'd like to see God, you know, do some of his wondrous works right now, right now. You see, the, see but the problem is, is that God has been telling them right along that he wants to do his wondrous works. But the people's hearts have been far from him. You know, even during this time, we're going to see Zedekiah. It's, it's going to be a few chapters. We're going to get to chapter 34 when the Babylonians have surrounded Jerusalem. And, and Zedekiah is sort of getting, it seems like he's getting this humble heart. And he starts, he starts interceding, you know, starts praying to God. And, and, um, and what happens is, you know, Zedekiah starts making some reforms. And as soon as he's making some reforms and he's making these steps towards God, well, it, it, God sort of removes the Babylonians a little bit. And as soon as things start to get better a little bit, Zedekiah recants and he goes right back to where he was before. And we're going to see that. But anyway, verse 3. Then Jeremiah said to them, thus you shall say to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands with which to fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of the city. So they're not going to be on the outside anymore. They're going to be in the middle of the city. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and fury and great wrath. And I will strike the inhabitants of the city, both man and beast, and they shall die of a great pestilence. And afterwards, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people, and such as are left in the city and, the, and um, from the pestilence and, and the sword and the famine into the land of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them nor have mercy. So you get the idea that God is sort of done with Zedekiah at this point in time. He's had enough of them. Zedekiah had done what so many after him would do. Um, they really just sought counsel that they wanted to hear. I, I don't think it's easy, uh, necessarily an easy thing to discern between good counsel and, and, and bad counsel um, at times, especially when your heart's involved. It calls for wisdom. You know, Zedekiah would just surround himself with people that would agree with him. He would surround himself with people that would just speak things to him that he wanted to hear. He liked hearing the praises of people. He liked the idea of, you know, our nation's going to be great again and all this kind of stuff. He, he liked that. And he was concerned more about the praises of the people than he was about the praise from God. And, you know, that's never going to end well. Verse 8. Now you shall say to the people, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will set before you the way of life and the way of death. I like that. God's always faithful to do that. Set before a people and a person the ways of life and the ways of death. He's designed life so that judgment would not come upon anyone without them having a clear choice before them. 
That's the way he's designed things, right? And so this is why Jeremiah is prophesying at this particular point in time, so that the whole nation of Judah would have set before them life and death, and that they would be able to choose. This is one of the reasons why you and I have been given the great commission by Jesus to go into all the world with his message. Why? So that everyone would have a very clear understanding of the choice that's before them of life and death and that they would choose accordingly. Choose accordingly. Now, not everybody's going to acknowledge that a choice is given, but nevertheless, a choice was given and is given. In Jeremiah's day, people could pretend like, well, I didn't know that it was really a choice. You know what? The day, the day will reveal everything. Nothing's hidden in the sight of God. All self-deceptions are immediately cleared up in the presence of him. He who remains in the city, verse 9, shall die by the sword by famine and pestilence, but he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who besiege you, he shall live and his life shall be a prize to him. For I have set my face against the city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord, and it shall be given, it shall, it, and, and it shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. And so there's the choice. There's the choice, but it wouldn't be an easy choice. You see, because people would have to, if they wanted to spare their lives, God says you can have life, but it's what you're going to do for life. You have to defect to the Babylonians. You have to walk out the walls, uh, out of the walls of Jerusalem, and surrender yourself to those who are coming to attack you, your enemies. enemies. That was life. That was life. The pressures of the peers uh, all of, in Jerusalem would be against them. If, I mean, pressures all around. I mean, there was a lot of nationalistic pride in, in, in Judah. Everyone wanted a third option. And the third option that the people wanted was to remain right where they were, and God, you deliver us from the hands of the Babylonians. But God didn't give them that option. It was life or death, and that was it. Life was leaving, and death was staying. You know, this message that Jeremiah is giving to Judah, in essence, made him a traitor. See, see no, one, no one wanted to hear what Jeremiah is saying. No, no one wanted to be, because, I mean, just like, just like um, Jesus told us, they, they didn't want to hear because their ways were evil. They, they didn't want to depart from their evil ways. And it's the same thing that happens today as well. You know, um, so many people don't want to recognize that life and death has been presented before them in, in Jesus Christ, right? They don't want to recognize that. Uh, they don't want to recognize that I have a choice to become a child of God. So many people want to go, I'm already a child of God. Third option, right? I'm already a child of God. You know, I'm already right with God. And, you know, I've just messed up some in my life and all that, but I'm already good with God. And God says, no, that's not the way it is at all. That's why Jesus Christ came. That's why Jesus died on the cross to take away our sin. But, you know, there takes, it, it needs that humbleness on a person's heart in order to come to God to admit that they are a sinner in need, in need of forgiveness. People will admit readily that they're not perfect, but to see that God set before them life and death and the need for the forgiveness of sins is needed in order to be saved, uh, for some people that's just too much. Verse 11 and concerning the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of David. So this is the, the royal line, right? That's what he's speaking to right here. House of David is the royal line. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him who is plundered out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doing. Now, Again, it's going to be interesting to hear how and see how Zedekiah and some of the nobles are going to listen to this to a degree. They are going to set the slaves free within Judah. 
But then as they see God r- relenting from the judgment, what do they do? What are they going to do? Again, we're going to see in a couple of weeks, they're going to quickly take all those slaves right back. See, this is what happens. This is what happens to a people, too. When, when, a, when a person doesn't pray, when they don't pray, something happens in their life. They're going through something tough, and all of a sudden, you know, they're really seeking God, and they're praying to God, and then God intervenes, right? God does something, you know, he answers that prayer or whatever. And what happens with that person? They immediately start attributing to that answered prayer to other things. Well, I'm sure I'm glad things turned out good for me. I sure am glad, you know, that I made this decision or that this other thing happened. Anything but giving glory completely to God. Zedekiah, you know, you see the Babylonians being pulled back he doesn't attribute it to God. And so what does he do? He just takes back the slaves. Again, we're going to see it in a couple of weeks. Verse 13, Behold, I'm against you, O inhabitants of the valley and the rock of the plain, says the Lord, who say, who shall come down against us and who shall enter our, dwelling, our dwellings? But I'll punish you according to the fruit of your doing, says the Lord. I'll kindle a fire in the forest and it shall devour all these things around you. And for two years, Babylon would surround Jerusalem. Two years, just starve them out. Chapter 22. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and there speak this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Now, chapter 22 backs up a little bit. We sort of get a, a history now of the warnings that God has been setting forth before the kings. Okay, God was faithful to warn all the kings of, of Judah. Remember, Jeremiah had a long prophesying career. It started with Josiah, and then it went through two of Josiah's sons to the grandson, and now to Zedekiah. Okay, so, so there's a, what's that, four or five kings dur- during that time. And so Josiah was a godly king, a godly guy. But from there, it went downhill fast. In this chapter, 22, we're going to see, we're going to see um, three kings. All the kings were out of control, wicked, come into view. The first one is Josiah's son, Jehoaz. Um, he didn't last very long, three months into power. Amazing how much damage, though, a person can do in power for only three months. Okay, but he did. He did a 180 on everything that Josiah did, completely ungodly. Then Pharaoh, um, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt, Nico, would come and he would take him um, and bring him to Egypt and, and put him in prison there. He would die there. And he put his brother in, in office in his place, who was also wicked. That guy's name was Jehoiakim. He reigned 11 years. And he, he served Pharaoh for a while because... They were, they were a vassal nation to, to Egypt for a while. And then he would rebel against them, and he would then become a vassal to um, the Babylonians. Um, that was Jehoiakim. He reigned 11 years. Nebuchadnezzar carried him away to Babylon, along with a bunch of treasure from the, um, from the temple. And then, then his son went into office after him, and that was Jehoah. Chin or Kin, very close name, also known as Je- um, Jeconiah or Coniah, and we're going to see him here. Again, that guy only reigned three months, too. Um, God had enough of that guy, and we're going to see some crazy stuff that God says about him. And so these are the three kings we're going to see in this chapter. Just follow with me. Zedekiah would be the fourth king, but he's not in this chapter. So, so God makes this proclamation to the kings in verses 1 and 2. Um, it doesn't say what particular king, but I think it was to probably all the kings. Each of them got to hear the same exact message. Verse 3, thus says the Lord, um, this is what God told the kings, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plunderer out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, um, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if indeed you do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. So God made it real simple to the kings of, of Judah. So you do these things and you're going to live. 
Okay, you're gonna you're gonna watch out for the poor. You're gonna watch over the the oppressed, the widows, the orphans, the refugees, the the immigrants are in the land. You're gonna watch over all of them. You're gonna judge justly. And if you judge justly, this is gonna be the result. You're gonna have heirs sitting on the throne. You're gonna be riding into Jerusalem through the gates on horses with chariots. It's going to be a good thing for the people. Problem was. <laughs> that way too often judicial systems just don't work that way. The plunderer, the problem, the problem is the plunderer is often rich and the plunderee is often poor. And if you're poor, well, who can afford a, a, a lawyer? And if it's government officials who are, you know, um, who, who are doing the plundering, uh, those guys who enforce the law and, and they do something illegal, illegal who's going to judge them? So the call to do no violence the, 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 there, um, you know, it was happening all over, to watch out for the stranger or the immigrant and the, and the refugee or the widow and the orphan. A lot of these things the judicial system just wasn't doing. It was just completely corrupt. You know, God sees this, so sees this stuff. God designed governments. God designed governments to protect the people. And here you have people sitting on the throne of David who eventually the Messiah is going to sit on that throne. Okay, that's, that's the whole point of the throne of David. And you have these kings sitting on there that are altogether corrupt. And God just is going to have enough of these guys. Look at verse 5. He says, but if you will not, if you won't just judge justly, right? If you will not hear these, these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become desolate. When God swears by himself, watch out. Verse 6. Thus is the Lord to the house of the king of Judah. You are Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon, yet I surely will make you a wilderness, cities that are not inhabited. I will prepare destroyers against you, everyone with weapons. They shall cut down your choice cedars and cast them into the fire. So Gilead was, a, um, was known for its beauty and its just prosperity. Uh, in Gilead, two rivers met, and so it was just a very good land, good, good land there. And, and, and God says, that's who you are to me. And Gilead at this point in time was completely overthrown because the Assyrians wiped them out. And, and God says, you're just going to be desolate. Jerusalem's going to be desolate. Verse 8. And many nations will pass by the city, and everyone will say to his neighbor, Why has the Lord done this to this great city? And then they will answer, then they will answer, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshiped other gods and served them. So it's interesting here that God has Jeremiah prophesy about what other people are going to say about Jerusalem. Other people are going to be passing by, and they're going to be looking at Jerusalem going like, why did God do this to his city? And other people are going to answer back and go, oh, it's because God's people forsook God. Other people are going to know exactly why it was. Other people are going to know that. They abandoned God. Other people are going to know. They turned their backs away from the ways of God. Before judgment happened, the inhabitants of Judah lived in a way um, as if they, they thought that God didn't care. God doesn't care about how we live. We can live any way we want. You know, look, look our, our parents before us were living this way. Their grandparents were doing these same things. We're just following. We're not any more wicked than they are. The, the problem is, the problem is, is it was at this point in time that judgment reached its full. And now God was saying, it's time to turn back. And they just didn't have the heart to. Verse 10. Weep not for the dead, nor bemoan him. Weep bitterly for him who goes away, for he shall not return anymore, nor see his native country. Now, verse 10 is talking about Josiah. This is where the story of three kings begins. Um, the whole destruction of the house of David. You know... When it says, weep not for the, for the dead, he's talking about Josiah. Josiah went to fight against um, Pharaoh Necho as Necho was coming to fight against the Babylons because he was coming straight through the land of Judah. And Josiah gets killed in, in battle. 
um, Pharaoh Necho takes over, um, it, it makes Judah a, a vassal nation for, um, for, for Egypt. And what God is saying here is don't weep for him. Weep instead. He's, he's already dead, right? But weep instead for his son because his son is going to go away. He's going to go away to Egypt and he's never going to see his native country again. Um, so that's, that son was Jehoaz, and he would only reign for three months. Wicked king. In three months, he undid a lot of what Josiah had done. Verse, verse 11, thus says the Lord concerning Shalom, um, that's, that's Jehoaz here. It's just a different name for him. The son of Josiah, the king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah, his father, who went from that place, he shall not return here anymore. But he shall die in the place where, um, where they have led him captive, and he shall see this land no more. And that would be in Egypt. He would be taken away as, you know, as a, a, a ruler that was deposed and be brought to Egypt. He would be mocked there, and eventually he would just die there. His brother would reign in his place, and his brother was just as wicked as him. Let's look at verse 13. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness, his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's, neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. Who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling with cedars and painting it with um, vermilion. In other words, what's happening here is the next king is going to build a palace for himself. See, Egypt made Judah a vassal nation. We, we, we did. They would pay heavy tribute to Egypt. And of course, when tributes were paid, was it paid by the rulers or is it going to be paid by the people? Well, you know it's going to be paid by you. So the burden of, of the taxes would rest upon the common person. What was Jehoiakim's response to all of this? The next king, Jehoiakim, what was his response to all this? I'm going to build a palace for myself. And so he's going to make it even harder on the people. He'd use his power and his authority to live a lavish lifestyle as the common person was having a harder and harder time just getting by. And of course, this isn't anything new. Right? I mean, history's seen this over and over and over again. And I mean, we don't even have to look far in order to see this. All around the globe, this is happening, you know. I, I think of Zimbabwe, I have some friends in Zimbabwe, and the reign of Mugabe, Robert Mugabe. I mean, he tanks the economy in Zimbabwe. I have a $50 billion bill from Zimbabwe. $50 billion. Half the bill is made up of just zeros. So it says five, and all these zeros after it. Where'd all the money go? And then after that, they started just using the, the, American, um, the, the American dollar. And just recently, there's no more dollars left. And where is it? All the government has it. The wealth is gone completely. And you could go right there. You could look at Yemen. You could look at Saudi Arabia. Look at Ukraine before, of course, the revolution. And all, you go right around the globe. Very few governments do what God has appointed the governments to do, to protect the people. Verse 15. So this kind of oppression just reigns, right? Um, continues. Verse 15. Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He says, would you just look? Look at what your father did. Josiah. He, he did justice. He did righteousness, and it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Was, was not this knowing me? says the Lord, yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness, for the shedding of innocent blood and for practicing oppression and violence. And so Josiah, his father, was a guy who knew God. And that was evidenced by the way that he lived and the way that he reigned. Just look at how a, look how a person is using the power that's been given to them. Look at how a person is using what God has entrusted with them right? Their wealth. Look at how they're using them. All the kings professed to know God. All of them did. All of the kings, if you ask them if they followed God, they would go, of course we follow God. And they would follow him in as much as it benefited them, right? It benefited them in front of other people. Micah 6, 8 says this, 
But he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Josiah lived that way. Unfortunately, his sons didn't and his grandsons didn't. They just reigned in a way to benefit themselves. Verse 18. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the the son of Josiah, king of of Judah. They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, my brother. Now, remember, this guy reigned for 11 years, okay? They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, my brother, or alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, master, or alas, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged out, cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. So this king, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to come in. He's going to put him in bronze fetters. He's going to start dragging him away. And some place along the line, he's going to die. His body's going to be cast out. Nobody's going to lament for this king at all. There's not going to be any wailing in the streets over this king. No one's going to tear their clothes, you know, throw ashes on their heads. There's going to be no mourning for this king at all. It's going to be more like a sigh of relief. The wicked king is dead. Um, It would have been, you know, his son's not going to be any better, though. Um, You know, Herod the Great was another guy just like this. During the first century B.C., first century um, A.D., running into that. Herod the Great um, oppressed the people badly. Uh, He made these lavish buildings, you know, at the expense of all the people. Just a brutal guy. I mean, you remember, you remember when Jesus was born. You know, the Magi come, they stop in, see Herod, you know, when's, where's the Messiah, the King of the Jews, been born? Oh, in Bethlehem, and he figures it out. He goes, just kill all the kids under two years old. He goes through Bethlehem, kills all the kids under two years. When Herod, when Herod was going to die, um, he knew the people weren't going to mourn his death. He knew the people were probably going to have a party. Instead, there's going to be dancing in the streets, not mourning in the streets. And so he designed a plan of what would happen when he died. He made a list of all the righteous people in Jerusalem, some of the top righteous people. And he, and he had them on a list, and, and some of the most popular men of Jerusalem. And he, and he said that when he died, they were to immediately go out, arrest these people, and then kill them in the streets so that there would be mourning in Jerusalem. And there wouldn't be partying happening. And so he did die. The soldiers were like, nah, we're we're not going to. He's dead. We're not going to carry out his orders. And so they did. But the same kind of vein that Jehoiakim here is in. He's just a rotten guy. And Nebuchadnezzar would just um, would, would destroy him. No one would miss him after 11 years of reign. Uh, you, you know, you look at that. And here God wanted the guy to prosper, setting before him life and death. And so he, so he had 11 years of reigning, 11 years of taking advantage of his position, 11 years of like, living high in the hog, right? I mean, oppressing the people and, and all that. At the end of 11 years, he's killed. No one's going to miss him at all. I, I mean, you think about that, you go, like, what nearsightedness that is. I mean, I hope those 11 years were somewhat fulfilling for you because you've been dead for close to 2,500 years at this point in time, and eternity hasn't even begun for him. You know what I'm saying? He's in that place right now of where he has been thinking for the last 2,500 years, what if I would have just listened to the prophet? What if I would have just heeded him? Verse 20, go up to Lebanon and cry out, lift up your voice in Bashan, cry from Abram, um, for your lovers are destroyed. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not hear. This has been your manner from your youth. (laughs) In your prosperity, you didn't think you needed God. You had all your alliances all around. 
So this is the way you've been since youth, that you didn't obey my voice. The wind shall eat up your rulers and your lovers shall go into captivity. And surely then you will be ashamed and humiliated for all your wickedness, O inhabitant of Lebanon, making your nest in the cedar. How gracious will, will you be when pangs come upon you like the pain of a woman in, in labor. So, you know, all these alliances that Judah had or this king had with the other ones trying to secure themselves a future and all of that wrong place to invest. All your alliances are going to go into captivity too. And, and then just think, everything could have been so different if they would have just set their heart towards God. That's, that's all. Verse 24, as I live, says the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the, the king of Judah, were the signet of my right hand, yet I would pluck him off. And so it's like if signet ring, he would say, I, just, I would get rid of it. Verse 25, let me, let me just mention something about him. Coniah, Jeconiah, Jehoiakim, these are all the same guy, just different names for the guy, kind of like um, nicknames and all that. I know it's confusing, but it's important here, okay? Because look at what happens. Verse 25, I, I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life, into the hand of those who face, whose, whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldeans. And so I will cast you out, you and your mother who bore you, into another country where you are not born, and there you shall die. But to the land in which they desire to return, there shall not be, or, or they shall not return. Is this man, Coniah? Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, O earth, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write down this man as childless, a man who does not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and, rule, and ruling any more in Judah. Now, I don't know what this guy did. Okay, Coniah here reigned three months. That's all he had. His dad reigned 11 years before him. I mean, both guys were wicked. This guy's only 18 years old when he began his reign. He reigns for three. But his life up until this point in time was such that when he entered into power after three months, God was like, I just can't take him anymore. I just can't take him anymore. He was a vessel in which there was no pleasure, it says there in verse 28. No pleasure at all. God couldn't take any pleasure in him. And, that, and now he had his father's legacy, his, grand, his, his father's legacy on top of his own and his uncle's, of course. Um, and no one's getting judged for his own relative sins, okay? okay? He's not being judged for his father's sins. It's his own sins. This guy's done wicked, and there's no warnings given to him. God just removes him. By the way, um, you, you look at this, this good guy. He just lived for himself, and he gets to this place of where God calls in the earth. Verse 29, O earth, O earth, hear the word of the Lord. He calls the earth as a witness to hear his words. That's crazy when God does that kind of stuff. Notice something that's really important here. In verse 30, it says, Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless. That's important. And listen what else it says. A man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. And God has called the earth as a witness to this curse that God placed upon this man, Coniah. None of his descendants are to be recorded. None of them. Now, that's a problem. That's a problem because the line of David, the throne of David, is coming through these kings, right? They're, they're the kings that are sitting on the throne. Who's ultimately going to sit on the throne? Jesus, right? The Messiah is going to sit, sit on the throne. That, that's a problem because David was promised that the Messiah was going to come through his genealogy. And here God has called a curse upon Kaniah, and that messy, this, this, this royal line was cut off in that curse. Now, when we get to the Gospels, Matthew gives the genealogy of Jesus. 
And when his genealogy is given, he he goes to David, he gets to David, he goes through Solomon, and he follows the kingly line right on through Kaniah, and then continues on through Joseph, who married Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. And there's Jesus' genealogy going through this royal line. Now, that's very interesting, and some people wonder why are there are two genealogies in the Gospels. Why does Matthew have one, and why does Luke have one, and how come Matthew has one, and Luke, or Matthew's one is different than Luke's? Because Luke's genealogy is different. And when Luke gives his genealogy, he comes down through David, doesn't go through Solomon where the curse is in the line where it's called considered fatherless. He goes through another son of David, which is Nathan, and goes all the way down through to Mary, who gave birth to Jesus. Why is that so important? Because the throne of David is forever inhabited by Jesus. He has a legal right to the throne, even though there was a curse upon the, the, this particular line. It's, he went through a different line. And so that's the two genealogies. Um, and there's a curse here upon this one. So anyway... There you have three kings, four if you include the first guy that we looked at in chapter 21 um, of Judah. Guys whose lives, they never surrender to God. You know, four who didn't surrender their lives to God at all, but they walked in their own ways. And what a shame. I mean, we could look at it today and we could look back and go, what a shame, what a waste of life. It could have been so different. It could have been. I guess the carryaway message on that in lesson is um, may we be a people who just don't waste our lives, but instead may we be a people that walk before our God humbly and allow God to use our lives to the fullest that he possibly can, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's pray. So Father, we thank you for your word. And God, you know, even um, bad examples are good examples for us if we would learn not to make the same mistakes they made. And so may that be so. May we not have hardened hearts towards you. And Lord, where they are hard, we, just, we, we pray that we would do the work of coming before you and begging you for that softness of heart. We don't want to have a saved soul in a wasted life. That would be just stupid. Lord, we want you to use these lives fully for your kingdom, Lord, in whatever capacity that is. And so we just offer ourselves afresh to you uh, once again tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.